Good morning and happy Sabbath again. I hope you're doing good today. Uh, I miss you guys and um, I'm Pastor John, of course, uh, Living Stones, Sunland Tahanga, Seventh-day Adventist Churches. And we're here now at the Living Stones Church. I've been rotating between the two churches because, um, hey, we're reaching both sets of people. And uh, also um, Pastor Mabel should be on the Sabbath school line also. And so uh, bless her as well and all of you out there and all of those going through the many different things we've seen on the call to prayer time. Uh, it's been really rough on many people out there, uh, but we know there is a larger plan. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. This question has come to me a couple times. Is this virus somehow a judgment of God upon the world? You know, uh, that question is always a difficult one because um, we do know that in the Bible there were judgments and things that were done against people for things. And we want to make sure, though, that we are biblical in our answer. Biblical, not according to just how a few places in the Bible are, but the vast majority of what the Bible says. That is very important to us. We must make sure also that everything is in light of what Jesus Christ did for us and how he judges. Because remember, even he himself received a judgment. He was supposed to call the woman that was caught in adultery, say that she's judged and to be stoned. But he had a very different answer than what many of the Bible scholars of the time thought. So let's bow our heads for prayer as we begin. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for loving us and holding us in the palms of your hands. Those palms who were, that were broken, spiked for us. Thank you for giving us the promise that you've engraved us in the palms of your hands. And throughout this great scare, that our economy, our world is facing, and our people are facing personally, and our medical professionals are facing, and everyone on the front lines. Lord, be with them, and be with this message in your name. Amen. So it's wonderful to have you here, and uh, as always, the Word of God needs to be central to our lives. So I have here the Bible. Are you ready to go with me? We're going to do a couple texts. So is this a judgment of God, this, uh, this virus? Well, there was a parable here. It's in Matthew chapter 13. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 13. And um, I'll start with verse 24 so we can go through that whole parable. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and they went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Verse 27. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't we sow good seed on the ground and in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? And his answer is very important here. Are you ready for it? He says in verse 28, an enemy did this. An enemy did this. And that's where I stop for a second. So many times in our lives, we, when we become Christian, we begin believing in the Bible, we believe in God, and we know that everything comes from God and all things uh, made are made by God, we sometimes forget a big fact, a major fact. An enemy exists. An enemy has done this. This leads us to a great controversy, a battle. A battle between good and bad. A battle between good and evil. 
And many times we don't want to believe there's any kind of battle at all. We don't like to talk about wars. We don't like to talk about disagreements in our culture and in many of the cultures of the world. We like to talk about unity and, and uh, we're all on the same team, even though oftentimes in our lives we find disunity and we find evil all through the world. And I know we sometimes try to um, make excuses for evil and say it was just, um, uh, it was their upbringing or the background, which of course we know that that has a reality to it, but there is evil in the world. And in fact, let's point back to the originator of all evil. Let's take a look here. We're gonna to go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, that's in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 28, and then I have something to show everyone, but we'll start reading it. Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're gonna start with verse 12. Now, um, many people, of course, say that this is only to the king of Tyre, because it says there, say to the king of Tyre these things. But then you'll notice as we're reading the text, the message is not just to the king of Tyre. You must understand in the Bible, so many times uh, when uh, there is a person that is evil presently, oftentimes that's only a shadow of something bigger behind. So the king of Tyre stands here in the foreground, but there's a bigger king behind him. I'm not talking about the king of Babylon or the king of uh, whatever. I'm talking about a bigger evil that is backing the evil that's right in front of you. Does that make sense? So let's keep, um, let's keep reading here, and then I'll have something to show everyone. So this is um, Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 12, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Verse 13, you were in Eden. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. The king of Tyre was not in Eden, but there was someone else in Eden. If you remember, there was Adam, there was Eve, and remember, Eve picked from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know who else was there? Besides Jesus or his preformed Michael or, uh, or God, you know, God uh, just God in general, uh, which is Michael or Jesus. Um, uh, there were animals, there were animals and there were plants, but there was one particular, a serpent. Remember a serpent? We're gonna find that serpent soon. There was a serpent that was there that tricked Eve. Remember that? So let's keep on going. So you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, crystalline, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of pure gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. So in other words, God made someone perfect, everything exactly the way it's supposed to be. And yet something happened. Ready to keep going? You were anointed as a guardian cherub. That's an angel. One of the angels that actually watches over God's throne. That's what you see on the Ark of the Covenant. The cherubs are there. He, this guy, whoever he is, is of massive importance. He was a guardian cherub. He was in Eden with Adam and Eve. And he was anointed. For I ordained you, God says. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the stones of fire. I love that, the stones of fire. That's visual. You were blameless in all your ways. From the day that I created you, God said, until 
wickedness. In the King James, iniquity was found in you. The word iniquity, um, well, the, the word that's translated here into iniquity is actually aon. That is internal sin. Wickedness is something where you, on the inside, you have a bent. It's kind of like a, a sword that's been bent, and then you bend it back, and it's kind of like, ooh, it either breaks or it doesn't work right. It has to be melted down and recast until iniquity was found in you. That, that first sin, that original sin in the heart of this cherub, this being, uh, we're going to come back here in a second, but let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14. Are you ready? Uh, follow with me, and we'll come back here. Isaiah chapter 14, starting with verse 12. How art thou fallen? I know I'm reading the, King, uh, the NIV, but I'm going to say King James because I love how the King James reads. How art thou fallen, O Lucifer? Son of the morning. In the, in the uh, NIV, it says, O oh, morning star. It's the same thing. Lucifer is the word for light bearer in, in uh, Latin. And that's why Lucifer is in the King James, because they're using the Latin name. But in the Hebrew, it is Chayelel, which means bright star. Lucifer, carrier of light. O oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. For you said in your heart, I shall ascend to heaven. I shall rise above my throne, above the stars of God. Wow. Lucifer. Ladies and gentlemen, I love action figures. And I have an action figure here. See this guy? Now, um, this is a character from um, actually Lord of the Rings. This character, of course, was in the Fellowship of the Ring. And I, I think I purchased it in 2005 or something like that. And then when I was at Temple City Church, I modified it and, and put wings on him. Uh, but um, so he is the symbolization of Lucifer in my office anyway. He said, I shall be like God. I shall rise above the most high. Notice that word, I, 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 all the time, I. It reminds me of a Beatles song, I, me, mine. Remember that? All through the day, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. Yeah, one of those, doesn't that kind of sound like humanity today? It's all about me, us, all about me. I will be like the Most High. You know, the problem with sin is there's a big eye problem. Now, I have an eye problem, my glasses, you know. If I don't have glasses on, I can't see as well. But I'll tell you, there's a worse eye problem. It's the, I shall be like the Most High. I'm gonna get what I want. I'm going to do what I want to do because I don't care what God wants. See that? There was a battle. Let's take a look here. What happened to this guy? So Lucifer, he said in his verse 13, uh, this is again, uh, Isaiah 14, verse 13. You said in your heart, I will ascend above the heavens. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of assembly of the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. In Hebrew, Mount Ziphon, the northernmost, the highest mountain of God, so to say. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will be, make myself like the most high. Verse 15 but you are brought down to the ground, to the depths of the pit. I can keep on going here, but you get the idea. Now I'm going to go to a location in the Bible, Revelation. 
where specifically, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, a place where Lucifer falls from heaven, truly falls. But he's not going to be called Lucifer here. He's going to be called something else. And we'll connect the dots up. Okay? In uh, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought back. I have a dragon also in my office, but I didn't bring it today, sorry. Maybe for another sermon. They fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought back with his angels. So the dragon has angels. Isn't it interesting? Let's keep on going. The dragon and his angels fought, uh, uh, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Verse 8. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent remember the garden of eden the ancient serpent called the devil or satan you know what satan means in hebrew satan means i accuse it's the guy that points at you and says you and actually, he points at God and says, God, you are wrong. I accuse you. You're the reason why this virus is here. You're the reason why there's pain and suffering in the world. You're the reason why everything is going wrong. That is why it must be God that did it. Satan means to accuse. Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and the angels with him. Ladies and gentlemen, since Adam and Eve chose from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because Eve wanted to know the difference and Adam wanted to know the difference between good and between evil. Therefore, when you choose to know the difference between the two, you're going to experience the two. We in our lives experience good and bad mingled together. We experience hard times and good times. And right now is a hard time for many, especially those. There are many I'm talking to today and I know you've been laid off. I know you don't have work anymore. God did not throw you out of your job. This is not a judgment against you. Neither is a judgment against those in Hollywood or against other nations or against... This is a reality of sin. Plagues have plagued our earth for centuries. Jesus has come to give you life and give it more abundantly. You see, this guy wants to be in charge. He wanted, when Jesus came, he said, why don't you just bow to me? Remember the third, the third temptation, bow to me and you don't have to die anymore. You don't have to go through anything anymore. All of the pain and suffering, everything. You, your father doesn't even care about you, Lucifer said. And Jesus said, it is is written the bible you shall worship the lord your god and him only shall you trust jesus would not bow down to lucifer lucifer says i am going to be like the most high and jesus said nope lucifer says i'm in charge i can give you all the nations and jesus goes nope they're mine. Jesus stretches out his hands. And with his, his own people, human beings kill him. He dies on a cross. So that the virus of sin and death may be destroyed. Because of that 
picking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil by Adam and Eve. We chose as human beings, our parents chose, and I know it's not fair. It's not fair that my sons have a genetic condition that Anna and I have recessive traits and so therefore they inherited that. Cystinuria, it's not fair, but it's a reality of sin. The truth is, is we need God. This thing that we are experiencing is a result of sin. And it's a part of this whole earth groaning. Remember this, if you've read in, in, uh, in Corinthians that the entire, or, or should I say Romans, the entire earth, all the animals, everything's groaning for new life to come. Do you know out there the animals themselves know that Jesus is God? They know it. It's just us. who have reasoning, have reasoned our way out of believing in God. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my friends, he calls you. Know that you cannot know the future, but know him that holds the future. In the book of Genesis, the person Joseph, and you've probably heard this story many times if you haven't, Joseph was a kind of bratty son of Jacob, or the Israel. And he, uh, he was of, a, uh, uh, of, of Rachel, whom, whom Jacob really loved. And, and uh, his brothers said, let's throw him in a pit. And they threw him in a pit and because, you know, daddy liked Joseph more. And they said, let's get rid of him. They wanted to kill him, but they decided not to. And said they, they sold him to slave. To, they enslaved him to, to Egyptians, and he became a slave never to be heard from again. Or was he? God used that time in Egypt for Joseph to not only rise up the rungs at Potiphar's house, which was basically the uh, far star general of Egypt, but then when thrown into prison for a crime he never did, it actually rose him to the throne of Egypt. He himself was over the top of Potiphar after 14 years, seven years in prison. And then he was brought forth and he became in charge of Egypt. When the brothers came back, they didn't realize that Joseph was in charge of Egypt. They needed food and Joseph was in charge. And at first he kind of didn't know if he wanted to be nice to his brother. He wanted to see if they would, they would kind of um, had changed. And some of them had, some of them hadn't, but some of them had. And when they finally found out that it was Joseph, their brother, they were scared and their hearts were pumping in their chest. And they said, are you going to kill me? Are you going to destroy us? And Joseph said, it was not you who put me in the ground, in the pit, and sold me into slavery. Of course it was his brothers that did it. We all know that. Joseph knew that. But he gave it to God. He said, God, God brought me here so that I might save you. So is this virus something that is sent from God? No, evil happens. It happens because there is a battle between Christ and Lucifer. There's a battle between good and evil, God and Satan. There is a battle. And the cross is the evidence of that battle. That's D-Day. But it doesn't mean that God cannot use horrible things to make something wonderful, something beautiful. He makes something beautiful of your and my life. He can make something beautiful of this virus. I pray to God that this virus time is a time when you and I can know God more. You can get to know your Bible. Spend the time. Take that time among all the craziness. Organize your life to be connected with Jesus. Don't take this as a judgment of you. Instead, look for an opportunity to change your life and make yourself stronger and ready for him when he comes again. For he's coming for all who have loved his appearing. Question is, do you want him to come? I want him to come. 
and I will see you there. Jesus can make something beautiful of your life. May God bless you all. Bye-bye.